Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Willow. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto where I study agroecology and this is my third year being involved in Envirothon and I have loved it every single time. I'm going to be doing a, a part of the soil section along with my colleague Zach DeLoretto. I think he's going to be talking a little bit more about soil properties, texture, whereas I'm going to be talking a little bit about soil applications. So what do soils do for us? What do they provide to us? And how can we manage them appropriately so that we're going to make sure that we get the most benefit from them? So we're going to be talking about the six different applications of soil. And these are really uh, describing how soil can benefit us if we are able to manage it properly. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, being a medium for plant growth. And if I had asked the question, what are the applications of soil? A lot of you probably would have said this one first. So what we can see in this video here is a plant seed. Let's just turn it up a plant seed that is sending out a very important first root. This is known as a taproot. It's anchoring in the plant, giving it stability so that when it does burst out the top, it has a sense of balance and stability. We then see a number of roots coming off of this taproot, which are known as transport or absorptive roots. And these are the roots that are doing the exploration in the soil for two different things. They're looking for nutrients and they're looking for water. Nutrients and water are both essential for a plant to be able to photosynthesize and create new tissue. So a soil is really providing a plant with three very important things to be able to grow. These are stability, so being an anchor in that soil so that when they grow out the top, they're not just going to topple over. It's providing nutrients. In particular, it's providing three main macronutrients, which are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, these macronutrients that are essential for plant growth. And it's providing water. So because soil has poor spaces, it can hold on to water for longer periods of time. Even if we haven't had rain for a couple of days, water can be stored in soil, giving a constant supply of water to the plant. The second application of soil is that soils are a recycling system for nutrients and organic waste. And this is an extremely important role that they play for us. So soil organisms, which we can see in these images, you see some earthworms, maybe some little roly-poly, uh, I used to call them potato bugs, as well as a variety of other microorganisms we can't see. These soil organisms can decompose organic materials, which we see in this uh, image. So these leaves, roots, um, different woody tissues by excreting a variety of enzymes, which break down the organic bonds within those materials. The uh, soil organisms can then use and absorb these nutrients that are released during decomposition as a food and energy source. As well, these broken down organic materials <clears throat> are now in a form that can be used um, by other plants. So this is a cycle that can continue of plants uptaking nutrients and growing, then decomposing and having their nutrients returned to the soil. If we didn't have uh, soil organisms doing this recycling work, we actually would just see a huge um, input of organic material with none of it being recycled. So our soils would essentially uh, be free of nutrients. They would have no nutrients. They wouldn't be able to support any plant life. So the third uh, application of soil that I wanted to talk about is one that you might not actually think about when you're thinking of soils, and that's that they are modifiers of the atmosphere. So we know that carbon dioxide is one of the most potent greenhouse gases on earth today. Plants, however, can take up carbon dioxide, this CO2, in order to perform photosynthesis to grow new plant tissue. 
the CO2 that they amalgamate into their tissue can then be excreted into the soil through plant roots and stored in the soil as a very stable form of carbon. And this is generally stored in uh, very deep soils and can, it can be stored for up to hundreds to thousands of years. So this is a whole pocket of carbon that we are not returning to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. This ability to store carbon and regulate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is extremely important. However, we can have some detrimental effects of soil as well in modifying the atmosphere. We've been seeing in recent years with climate warming, a huge portion of carbon that's stored deep in permafrost being released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide because of permafrost melt. We also see a large amount of carbon being released from the soil and put into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide through soil disturbances. And a lot of these are coming from our agricultural activities. So different management styles, such as tilling in agricultural landscapes, it actually rips open the soil surface and that leads to a lot of uh, respiration or release of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. We're allowing that soil to get oxygenated, bonds to the carbon molecules, and released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So we really have to uh, be aware of how we need to treat our soils in order to make sure that they're modifying the atmosphere for the better and not for the worse. So the next application of soil is that soils provide habitat for a huge number of soil organisms. If you took just a teaspoon of soil, you would have more soil organisms in that one teaspoon than all of the mammals on earth today. It's quite amazing. And these soil organisms can be broken down into two different groups. We have what are probably the more popular so soil organisms, the macroorganisms. These are the ones that we can really see with our eyes. So things like earthworms, spiders, mites, those roly polies, the, the potato bugs that I was talking about. These are the macroorganisms that are really shaping the structure of the soil. So they're moving through it, they're creating tunnels, which are creating pockets of water, pockets of nutrients. So we really refer to these macroorganisms and earthworms in particular as the engineers of the soil. But maybe the more interesting soil organisms are the ones we can't see, the microorganisms. Things like algae, mycorrhizal fungi, and different forms of bacteria. These are the organisms that are really doing the bulk of the decomposition work as well. They're the ones that are doing a lot of the turnover of nutrients and adding new nutrients to a soil. So I just want to talk about one microorganism in particular, and this is a nitrogen fixing bacteria. I find these absolutely fascinating. So here we can see a root of a plant which has nitrogen fixing bacteria on it. So this is a symbiotic relationship, which means that both the plant and the bacteria are benefiting from this relationship. So plants are not able to use N2 gas. N2 gas is something that is very abundant in the atmosphere. We have a ton of it, but plants can't actually use any of it. They can only use the nitrogen that is available in the soil. However, nitrogen fixing bacteria can use N2 gas. And so they attach to the root systems of the plants and in exchange for a little bit of carbon, they can actually pull N2 gas out of the atmosphere for this plant to use. This is particularly important in environments where we have uh, nitrogen as a limiting nutrient in the soil. So there's a very specific uh, family of plants that are able to perform this symbiotic relationship with the nitrogen fixing bacteria. Not all plants are able to do this. 
the plants that are able to are in the family of legumes. So if you see on the left, we have a clover, which is a legume, in the middle, some soybean, and on the right, peanut. These are all different types of legumes. Now, if you've ever taken a drive down in the country and past some farm fields, or maybe you have a farm yourself or have visited one, you may notice that farmers will plant uh, clover or soybean every two to three years, and they do this purposefully. They do it because the relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria can add nitrogen to their soil that wasn't there before. Regularly, they would have to apply fertilizer, organic or synthetic fertilizer in order to get that nitrogen. So by planting these legumes, they're able to add nitrogen to their soil, improve the fertility of it without using any additional fertilizer. So this means that every two to three years, they will mulch in these species, which adds a huge amount of nitrogen, and then their cash crop that they grow, maybe it's corn, maybe it's wheat, will be able to grow better in the subsequent years. All right, the next application of soil is one that is probably pretty obvious. Soil is an engineering medium. We build on top of it. We build buildings and roads on top of it, but we need to know a little bit about soil properties before we can decide what we're actually going to build. In particular, we need to know something about the structural components of a soil. This means we need to know something about pore spaces. If you are deciding to build a building and you wanted it to be structurally sound, you probably don't want to build it on top of sand. Sand does not stick together very well. It has really no cohesion. Um, if you've ever gone to a beach and you build a sand castle, it kind of, if it's dry, it just all topples down. It doesn't stack very high. So it's not a great thing to use as a building medium. On the other side of that, you don't want to use anything that's too high in clay. Clay has this ability to hold a lot of water. It has these really tiny pore spaces, but they have a lot of them. So when they get wet, they hold a ton of water, and this means that they expand a lot. And when they get dry and they lose water, they contract. So if you were to build a road on top of certain types of clay, you might see this expanding and contracting, which would essentially just crack your pavement. So knowing something about the soil structure is going to be important when deciding what to build and when to build on top of soil. Finally, soil is used for water purification. And the ability for a soil to filter out excess sediments and nutrients and pesticides is going to be based on the pore size of a soil. So if, for example, you have a very coarse soil, something like a sand, large pore spaces, this is going to be a pore filter. You're going to have the water running straight through the soil. There's really no adhesion for the nutrients or the sediment or the pesticide onto the soil surface. They're just going to filter straight through. When you have a finer textured soil, you're going to have a better filter. This means the water is going to flow through the soil and it's going to adhere to those nutrients and pesticides and other sediments. It's going to take them up on the soil surface and be able to then capture it, store it, and maybe those will be used by other vegetation in the area. These are things like silts or loams are going to be really good at this. Now, if you have a soil with too fine of a texture, things like a high clay content, you're not going to have a good purification system because you have inadequate flow. So water can't even get through the soil, so it's not going to be able to adhere or take up any of those nutrients because it's not moving across the soil surface. So in areas like this, you might be prone to flooding. Now, the reason that we're worried or we want soil to act as a purification system is because we can have some problems when we have 
too much nutrients, too much sediment or pesticides entering a water system. What occurs is known as eutrophication or it's these big blooms of algae. When you have excess nutrients, you have a huge bloom of this uh, plant species, algae. They love it, they're getting lots of nutrients, they're getting lots of sunlight, and they're just thriving. They're blooming and growing and growing and growing. Well, eventually, all of that algae is going to die and start to decompose. And the process of decomposition uses a lot of oxygen. So when all of that algae starts to decompose, it's taking up a lot of oxygen from the water and creating what are known as dead zones. This means that the water is deprived of oxygen, and this can be really detrimental, especially for wildlife. Things like fish or amphibian species, which are in the water. And we see eutrophication occurring all over Canada, particularly in the Great Lakes. So by understanding how soils can purify water, and in particular, having vegetation along water lines, we can actually create healthier water systems. All right, those are the six applications of soil. Just to briefly go over them again really quickly, we saw that soils provide a medium for plant growth, giving stability, nutrients, and water to a plant. We saw that they are the recycling systems of the earth. So their uh, microorganisms are working to break down organic materials and return them to the soil. We also saw that they are modifiers of the atmosphere. So they're able to store as well as emit large amounts of greenhouse gases. So management of soils is going to ensure that we're using them as a sink of greenhouse gases rather than a source emitting more. We saw that they are habitat for a huge range of soil micro and macro organisms. So in one teaspoon of soil, you see more diversity and more abundance of soil of organisms than all of the mammals that we have on earth today. We saw that they're in engineering medium. So we build on top of them. So knowing about the properties of soil is going to be really important ensuring that we have stable buildings and they're used as water purification, ensuring that we don't have water that has too much nutrients, pesticides, or sediments, all of which are being flowed into water systems every single day when they don't have appropriate management. Thank you for watching and I hope you guys have a great rest of your semester.